Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Walter Sartori and Willa Block? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Walter Sartori was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on May 17, 1935. His father was a house painter. Walter had one sister. Growing up, he was a Boy Scout, played with rockets, and was highly interested in space. Walter attended Carnegie Mellon University and earned a Ph.D. in chemical engineering. In 1962, he took a job at Oak Ridge National Laboratory where he would work for 30 years. The work that he performed at the laboratory was classified by the United States government. It may have involved uranium. A co-worker of Walter indicated that not only was Walter a brilliant mathematician, he was highly practical. He could comprehend the nature of a problem very quickly. He was able to solve problems other scientists at the site could not. Whenever there was a complex question, Walter was the scientist people would go to. By the time Walter retired, he had three patents, which earned him a good deal of money. He rented a small apartment and used algorithms to invest in Wall Street. He had built a $14 million portfolio before the stock market crashed. Even after this, his net worth was substantial. In 2008, which was 16 years after Walter retired, he moved to Hebron, Kentucky, which is just west of Cincinnati, Ohio. He lived in a house that was modest compared to his wealth. Walter never married and never had children. He had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and suffered from social anxiety. Walter regularly took medication to treat psychosis. He appeared to understand the nature of schizophrenia, at least to some degree. Mental health clinicians advised Walter that he should socialize more, and he was attempting to do this. He selected his house in Kentucky in part because of its proximity to a major airport. Walter traveled to various conferences, which covered topics in which he was interested, and visited friends he met online. Other than going out to pick up groceries or running other errands in his silver Toyota Prius, Walter was pretty much isolated all the time. Neighbors said that he wouldn't even bother to wave when they saw him, and he never spoke to them. Most of his contact with other people came in the form of online chat rooms. Walter was fascinated with existential topics. He was very interested in trying to determine if God existed and if aliens existed. He wrote algorithms designed to detect radio signals from aliens. He also developed algorithms to help him buy and sell stocks. I imagine it was important not to confuse those algorithms, or else he might have ended up buying a bunch of aliens at too high of a price. Now taking a look at the background of Willa Blanc, who is another important figure in this case. Willa Blanc was born in Cincinnati, Ohio on June 19, 1961. She had three sisters and two brothers. One of her brothers drowned in a river. Her mother died when Willa was 13. Willa had to fend for herself at this point. She lived in her own apartment by the age of 15. When she was 19, she had a son named Lewis Wilkinson. Over 20 years later, in 2001, Willa was working as a house cleaner. One of her customers was a man named Paul Block. By this time, Willa was described as flashy. She also drove a Corvette. Apparently, this captured Paul's attention. A few months later, Paul and Willa married. Willa and Lewis moved into Paul's house in Union, Kentucky which is southwest of Cincinnati, Willis started spending Paul's money at a rapid pace, running up about a half a million dollars in debt. Sometime later, the mortgage company would foreclose on Paul's home. It appears as though Willa was looking for a new victim who she could steal from. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Helix Sleep. Like most people, sleep is really important to me. I have not always had good success sleeping, Therefore, I'm careful about my mattress selection. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs. 
and conveniently shipped right to your door. They have designed a sleep quiz to match your unique body type and sleep preferences to make the perfect mattress for you. They have something for everyone, and if you sleep with a partner, you can even take the quiz together. I personally sleep on my side, like a firm mattress and share a mattress, so the quiz matched me with the Dusk Lux mattress. I've had a number of mattresses in my time, but the Helix Sleep mattress is by far the best. It's more comfortable and more supportive than anything I've ever tried. I also ordered the Glaciotex cooling cover, which has been very useful for hot weather. With your Helix Sleep mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial, along with a 10 year warranty, and financing options are available. You have three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up and give you a full refund. I love my Helix, and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Helix. Click on the link in the description or go to helixsleep.com slash drgrande for up to $200 off your Helix sleep mattress plus two free pillows. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Starting in mid-2008, Willow Block started bothering Walter Sartori. She kept asking him if she could clean his house. He kept refusing. He said that she would come in the house and be there for two hours. He didn't know how to get her to leave. In January 2009, Walter went on a trip to Binghamton, New York. In February, when Walter was still out of town, a massive snowstorm hit the Cincinnati, Ohio area, which of course includes Hebron, Kentucky. Willa Blanc and her son Louis shoveled Walter's driveway when he was out of town, undoubtedly as part of a criminal plot. When Walter returned to his house in Kentucky, he was surprised to see that his driveway had been shoveled. He didn't know who did it. Two days later, Willa Blanc removed the mystery when she stopped by Walter's house. She handed him his mail that she had taken from his mailbox and told him that she and her son had shoveled the driveway. Walter allowed her to come inside his house and offered to pay her for the work, but she refused to take the money and she initially refused to leave the house. Walter would later send an email to a friend explaining his concern about this encounter. He explained that it might be his paranoia, but he did not trust Willa. He thought that she might be running a scam, casing his house, or both. Walter suspected that she may have picked up a key that was on his computer table and put it in wax to make a copy of it. He had all the locks in his house changed in response to Willa's visit. On February 17, Willa somehow kidnapped Walter. The police are not sure how she did it. Willa took him to the house that she shared with her husband, Paul. This was before the mortgage company foreclosed on it. But Paul was not aware of what she was doing. She used duct tape to restrain Walter to a chair in the basement. Eventually, Willa murdered Walter, probably by poisoning him. It's not clear how much her son, Lewis, helped Willa with her crimes, but it's clear that he was aware of the kidnapping, at the very least, because he admitted to seeing Walter duct taped to the chair in the basement. Lewis denied having anything to do with the kidnapping or the murder. On February 22, 2009, Willa drove her husband's Chevy Trailblazer to Indiana. She had a trash can in the back which contained Walter's body. At 4.15 a.m. in Ripley County, Indiana, Willa slammed into another vehicle that had stopped in the road. The police responded to the collision. They said that Willa was calm. They had no reason to be suspicious. The trailblazer was towed back to a Chevy dealership. Willa and Lewis moved the trash can into a rented Dodge Caravan, and they drove to an acquaintance of Willa's. This individual had a farm. Willa paid him $1,000 to burn the trash can. She told him the story about how Lewis had hit and killed a dog, and the dog's body was in the trash can. She didn't want the owner of the dog, which was a man that she took care of, to find out what happened. The man took the thousand dollars and burned the trash can. He didn't know that Walter's body was in it. Friends of Walter who had met him online reported him missing on February 26. The police didn't enter his residence until March 4. They didn't find him in the house, and his Toyota was missing from the garage. Neighbors described a cleaning service vehicle that had been in Walter's driveway. The police tracked down the owner of the company. He said that he was hired to pick up the mail by Willa Blanc. 
The police spoke to Willa on March 9. She said that she was friends with Walter and had seen him just two days earlier at a store. Here's what the police discovered as their investigation continued. On February 17, Willa had visited a Chevrolet dealer to talk about buying a new Corvette. She told them that she would soon have $7.5 million in cash. Lewis walked into the dealership as Willa was talking with the employees. He said to Willa something like, the old man wants to get out of the car. Willa told Lewis, tell him to stay in the blank car or he will pay for it later. The police believed that the old man Lewis was referring to was Walter Sartori. Willis somehow secured power of attorney for Walter. She had the help of an impersonator who was approximately his age. This conspirator has never been identified. Willa wire transferred $210,000 of Walter's money to herself. On February 21, Willa gambled at a casino in Indiana all through the night. The police found out about the collision, which occurred on February 22, and that Willa had a trash can in the back of her vehicle at that time. She had told the police at the scene that it was full of firewood. The police questioned Willa again. She said that she had power of attorney for Walter, but never used it. The police knew this wasn't true. She also could not explain what happened to the trash can that had been in the back of her husband's trailblazer during the collision. She said it must have been stolen. The police tracked down the man who Willa paid to burn the trash can. He told them what Willa said about the dog. He led them to the site where the burning took place. The police found bone fragments there that were eventually identified as belonging to Walter. On March 14, 2009, Willa and Lewis were arrested. They were charged with a number of offenses, including kidnapping and murder. In January of 2012, Willa Block was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole after pleading guilty to avoid the death penalty. In September of 2012, Lewis Wilkinson was sentenced to 30 years in prison after pleading guilty. He will be eligible for parole in 2029 at the age of 47. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Willa did not really say anything to the police after she was arrested, but Lewis did. He said that he did not have control, he was a weak person, he needed help, and when referring to his mother, he said, she's bad. Lewis was horribly mistreated as a child. He claimed that Willa would put insects in his food and lock him in a closet all day long. He was diagnosed with conduct disorder, and Willa eventually lost custody of him. Lewis was first arrested at the age of 19 for stealing credit card numbers. Years later, Willa and Lewis reunited. I think it's reasonable to believe that Lewis was both a perpetrator and a victim at the same time. Willa did not have any difficulty manipulating Lewis. Moving to item number two, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Willa appeared to be highly narcissistic. She was fascinated with symbols of status, like expensive vehicles. She was planning on buying a Corvette ZR1 with the money that she was stealing from Walter. This car cost over $100,000. Willa also appeared to have a gambling problem. She needed a constant supply of money to support her grandiose self-image. Willa had already taken all the money she could from her husband. She had destroyed him financially and needed a new victim. While cleaning houses in Walter's neighborhood, Willa noticed Walter. She conducted reconnaissance in the form of harassing him to clean his house. Willa noticed that he lived alone and that his behavior was unusual. She probably figured out that he had some type of severe mental disorder. She took his mail and realized he was worth millions of dollars. Willa decided to kidnap Walter. She probably used a firearm to threaten him. The police found a handgun among her possessions. She held him hostage to collect account passwords and other information so that she could steal his money. After this, she poisoned him and disposed of his body. Will did not have any compassion for Walter. He was just an object to her. She never accepted responsibility and never had any remorse. Moving to item number three. The irony of this case is that Walter was paranoid and was murdered by someone who statistically would be very unlikely to commit murder. He spent his life being afraid of low probability risks 
only to become the victim of one. Walter suspected that people were out to get him. He thought that CIA agents were spying on him and tampering with his car. He believed that people were mocking him. For example, one time when he was out of town having dinner with a friend, he thought a waitress was laughing at him. People listening to Walter's complaints about Willa may have thought that Walter was just being paranoid. Walter himself acknowledged that it might be his paranoia. After all, Willa was a house cleaner, an occupation typically not associated with homicide. For instance, no one ever asks a house cleaner how much extra is the homicide service, although a homicidal house cleaner would have an advantage over most killers because they would be better at cleaning up the crime scenes. Item number four, one of the most unusual elements of this case is how Willa Block found Walter Sartori in the first place. Walter deliberately kept to himself. He didn't look for trouble. He rarely talked to anyone in the area where he lived. His communications were restricted almost entirely to online. One would think that Walter would have been out of harm's way. After Willa's arrest, the police found a book inside of a safe located in her house. The book had a title something like How to Choose Your Prey. Willa prided herself on being able to identify victims. Now moving to my final thoughts. Walter Sartori assessed just about everything in his life as a threat. But when it came to Willa Blanc, his assessment was correct. Unfortunately, his mental health symptoms, including the paranoia, made him more vulnerable. Being suspicious of everybody is like having a fire alarm that goes off all the time without there being a fire. There's no way to distinguish a valid alert from an invalid one. Therefore, all of the alerts lose their meaning. Those are my thoughts in the case of Walter Sartori and Willa Blanc. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a homicidal house cleaning service. Thanks for watching.